Okay, so uh, just to start with a round of introductions, uh, I'm Timothy Hill, uh, Data Standards and Technical Lead with the Open Data Institute and putative chair of the, of the meeting. Uh, Ollie, can you uh, let us know who you are? Yeah, sure. I'm Ollie Sisman, um, Digital Project Manager at London Sport. Nick. Hello, uh, Nick Evans, uh, Director at IMIN. And finally, Dom. Yeah, I'm uh, a developer at Porism, uh, developing the uh, Open Referral UK version. Uh, okay, fantastic. And I suspect uh, Dom, Ollie, and I will all have uh, more to talk about, talk, uh, more to say about social prescribing in the future. Uh, however, at the moment, I'll focus on uh, today's agenda for the call. Uh, let me just start sharing my screen here. Not that screen, however. Okay, can you all see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, most of the agenda for the call is focused on the dataset site specification. So the uh, HTML and JSON that needs to be present on the basic splash page uh, that you encounter when first spidering for open active data. And there's a little addendum that was uh, added to the agenda just recently um, because Nick flagged up some conversations that were happening in connection with the MCR active uh, project uh, regarding the complicated uh, matter of opening hours, particularly in uh, COVID realities we've got right now. Uh, so that'll be at the end of the discussion. Uh, now, hopefully we can move um, fairly quickly through the data set site discussion. Um, it's been under discussion for a while now, and as our standards go, it's one of the more, mm, one of the less dynamic ones, I would say, that we can specify things, it's a fairly known, uh, domain, what should be on that page. Um, so it's mostly details that we're discussing rather than broad philosophical uh, differences. I thought you meant less dynamic is in dull. Was... <laughs> no, less dynamic in, in the sense it's reassuringly stable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so um, there's three issues, I think, that are remain unresolved. Um, in connection with the with the specification. The first is a fairly minor one, but it's the guidance concerning human readable text, because the data set site um, obviously has human readable content. Most of the um, business work is done by the JSON objects that are embedded in that page, but there is something there for people to read. Um, and obviously it makes sense for that information to be as complete as possible. Um, there's no advantage to being vague in, in the human readable aspect. Um, but the question is, should this, should the guidance that's given concerning what should be in that content, should that be uh, required as a status or recommended? Um, I don't think there's, personally, I don't think there's any problem with making it required beyond the fact that it was enunciated as a general principle that required fields would be those things that are checked by validators. Uh, that if you've, you've got something that you can definitely put a green tick next to, you can sensibly make that required. If you don't have that capacity, it becomes more difficult to make that kind of strong assertion. Obviously for human readable text, that's a disproportionately difficult task to give that level of, of machine intelligence to, to parse that out. Um, so I'll just throw it open to the floor. Does anybody have a feeling about, about maybe weakening that guidance to reflect that? Or is human readable text a special case and we don't have to perhaps be quite so pedantic about that, about that difference? Yes, yeah, so I, had a, I had a quick read of the, um, the open, quick read of the open uh, ID spec mm -hmm. um, uh, just to see how they dealt with it because there's some stuff in there about um, needing to have certain details on a confirmation screen things like that um and I, it seems that we could be we could reasonably say 
um, required in the kind of sense that we could say it's required that you have human human readable, like a human readable form of something that includes these things. Um, not that those things will ever appear in a, in a validator, as you say, but more um, that, that we're kind of really describing what the thing is, the like almost non-functional in a way, I suppose. Um, but 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 still important in the way that other um, specs have. You know, the consent screen in OAuth obviously needs to not just be a happy face with a with a green button. Uh, so there is a like a um, yeah a need for um, a bit more detail there. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if the difference though is that OAuth presumably that's got some kind of legal ramifications. That's responding to a particular legislative demand in some jurisdictions anyway. Yeah. Um, here it's about, it's more about politeness than anything else. Um, you know, what does a developer make of it when they come to your site? Um, and what is, what is the sanction, I suppose, if somebody fails to meet that requirement? I mean, are we really going to yank them off the status page if, if they don't have uh, some information present in the human readable text? I suppose that's a good question, isn't it? Because if that's where, if that's our kind of metric, like, are we going to uh, endorse them as open, active, compliant? Um, if if you can't read the page, because I suppose in the worst case, it's a black and white page or no page, uh, just a bit of JSON. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess the question, maybe an ecosystem question here, is if that's what we end up with, do we end up with a usable developer experience for the people that are trying to find the information? And then is that going to create the kind of, I suppose, open ecosystem we want, referencing previous conversations we've had around uh, if everyone uh, publishes stuff all over the place and you need uh, a PhD in Open Active to figure out what to do with any of the data because it's all so diverse and crazy, um, then, um, yeah. So, so maybe, there's a, maybe there's like a kind of tangible benefit to us in at least having some minimum that isn't just a white page. Yeah, I suppose also it's it's hard to see why anybody wouldn't provide that information in a sense that things like organization name, um, licensing information, that kind of stuff. Actually, yeah, maybe licensing information is where where the rubber meets the road because that is legally actionable. Um, that's that's the bit actually where, yeah, um, if somebody relabeled the data as their own or violated the license terms like that, that's actually the bit that um, there's a an enforcement mechanism back there. Um, mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Um, hmm. And once once you're saying that it is it is licensed, you then have to say who <laughs> who has who has added that license and so on and so forth. So everything unrolls kind of out of that in a way. Yeah, right. That's true. And actually, that's a good point because the only example we've had of someone customizing their page so far was Good Gym. Um, I don't know if they've still got it, but they kind of made their own page before they realized there was a template because they had a Ruby template and they just stuck some you know, stuck a link on the page and said whatever they said. Um, I think we had a conversation at the time, something along the lines of, that's really exciting you're doing that. That's what the point of the spec is going to be. Uh, we don't have a spec yet, so I can't tell you if that's right or wrong, but uh, it's great that you're enthusiastic. Um, so, uh, but, but they did miss the license um, and the text of the license specifically, that kind, of, that kind of thing, that kind of ODI sanctioned blurb that's at the bottom of the data set site template um, was, not, was not present. So it's a good point. Okay, well, let's let's maybe, yeah, maybe from a legal standpoint, look at it like that. And then I suppose also in the guidance, just indicate the advisability, of course, of giving information so that people can do something with your data. Um, and yeah, that, that gives it a kind of firm footing. Yeah, and also does the ODI have, um, because this is, I think this is probably originally ODI guidance that became the data set site uh, early on. So I wonder whether, um, the ODI has, uh, I feel like uh, there's probably a blog possibly written by Lee from like a long time ago that uh, it contains some stuff um, that says what the what a data set should have because open data certificates do something like this, don't they? Um, they there's like a tick list of things that you have got. Um, Maybe one of yeah, I think again they're a bit more machine actionable though. I think that's the. Um... 
if, um, if memory serves. Um, I think I think that the certificate is, but getting the certificate, I think you've got to tick a lot of boxes, which are quite fuzzy. Like that's true. The self-assessment process. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think one of those is like I have a data set site that's well described and blah blah blah. Um, so yeah, maybe. Um, okay, we can we can link to that. Um, I would say it's a bit unfair citing a blog post by Lee simply because there's there's a ninety nine percent chance that <laughs> that blog post does exist. Um, like the, the the potential authority on everything. Um, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> it's a bit unfair citing a blog post on Lee. Uh, you mean from the perspective of us having a conversation about concluding something? Because yeah, well, also just I suppose the. Uh, I'm not accusing you of this, but I feel like it would be possible to justify anything by saying there's a blog post by Lee and it would be <laughs> But I'm getting the reference to the blog post to send you is the key thing not just not right. just the statement of yeah, 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 that's true uh, <laughs> Yeah, otherwise left unfact checked that could be abused <laughs> um, uh, Okay, so I think I think we're happy to uh, make that required um, from a legal and, and I suppose recommendation standpoint from from uh, uh, Lee slash the ODI. Um, Oli, Dom, do either of you have any um, thoughts on this question? Do, do you want to bring up what the data set site is actually maybe to show them the context? I just realized without that discussion um, as in an example of one on this data space. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Because that might be, because I, I mean actually Oli and Dom are perfect examples of people that will look at the site and um, the question to ask, I suppose, is what's the minimum on this web page that would make it useful for you? Um, classic. Yeah. <laughs> 1610. Um. <laughs> okay, so is everyone seeing the data set site now? Um, sorry, if you jump to, if you go to a glass one, that's actually the old version I've just realized. Uh, it's been updated in since then, so any, any, um, there's a few that are new, but any, um, uh, uh, name a Gladstone L for me. LED would be actually fine. And maybe if it's got, there we go. Yep. Great. That's it. Okay. So yes, uh, Ollie and Dom. So what we're talking about is this HTML page, uh, from a machine point of view, what's important is these links, session series, scheduled session, facility, facility use and slot. Those all point to our PDE feeds of data but obviously there's also some text here um, to make this friendlier for developers and yeah this is this is what the discussion uh, pertains to okay well the main thing I'd be interested in is how to use the API so what does the documentation uh, lead to right okay yeah so that's and we will be discussing that shortly two points down on the agenda um, yeah, so right now that takes you to GitHub. Oh, sorry, no, it doesn't. It takes us, it takes you to the developer open active site, um, which includes guidance on how to harvest RPDE. Um, yeah, on the bottom left, I think there's a, there's a thing there, there we go. So yeah, it does indeed take you to documentation as you, as you would expect. Um, that documentation right now doesn't um, cover the booking specification, which we'll be talking about shortly. But, so yeah, the main observation, I want to get to the documentation. Yeah, also the data, the fact that it's um, open source, it's saying there isn't it, Creative Commons, mm -hmm. which is um, useful to know. Yeah, okay, so yeah, the licensing. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there any worth of feedback? So there's any issues? Uh, yep, so there's discussion. That's, that's, great. The, that's the link that takes you to GitHub there. That, that gives you the issues attached to that, that um, feed. Okay, um, yeah, it's good. I mean, does, does this need to be uh, like standardized between these different endpoints at all? So do they need to be labeled consistently across the different endpoints or is it all expected to be? For instance, if you go to a Swagger page, uh, for API, and it's all done in a standard format. Everything's pretty much standardized. Yeah, so for this, there's a, the, the bits that are standardized. Well, right now, in fact, there's a template. The text is standardized. 
And then each of these links here takes you to a, an RPDE feed. And any link with that kind of label on another data set site should take you to a similarly structured feed, um, which will be in accordance with the documentation linked to here. Uh, but it's not as it's not as kind of neat as say a swagger API documentation would give you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I was thinking. If if I had to um was looking at multiple ones of these and they're all labeling, you know, like every label in a different way. Uh, using different terminology for the same thing, it might get a bit confusing. Um, yeah, the terminology should be should be the same. Um, that's a the super interesting point though, because as 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 is it um as as are having people like Good Jim and others creating their own kind of theme on it might be cool for them. From a data user's perspective, you actually don't really want to have to look at every single page and go, where on this page have we put the links? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. And I suppose in fact they could label these differently right now. There's nothing telling that they have to. Mm. label I can't imagine why anybody would not label it according to the type represented but it doesn't that's not explicitly stated in the specification mm -hmm. uh, okay. that's really interesting yeah yeah you almost want to it's yeah you're, you're, you almost want the minimum to be I mean we, we probably can't mandate the whole template but the minimum of like the um, the links to the feeds have to be central and uh, and clear and the documentation like we probably can't say upper white right quadrant upper left quadrant for the buttons but um yeah i see i i, I do you see what um don's saying like if if it's a, if it's a complete maze and the terminology is different the colors are different everything is different then uh this is going to be, become a minor nightmare so maybe i mean is there i mean could we um uh, could we provide an example in the documentation? I mean, in, in the in the in the data set site. I mean, there are legitimate examples in other, um, uh, yeah, in other specifications. I mean, I don't know if it's worth screen, almost screenshotting one of them or making one up, uh, and uh, or or making a um, like a like a what's it called that UI program that we use to make funky. Oh, like balsamic or something. Yeah, like a balsamic sketch, which just has the key bits that this has on it, mm. um, and just that there's a so there's at least a prototype thing that that um, can be pointed at. So if someone makes something completely crazy where everything's upside down and inside out, we can just point them to the image and say, "Great, great first try, but maybe you need to make it look more like this, otherwise you're going to confuse a lot of people." Yeah, and I think that's easy enough to put into the guidance as well. That, you know, maybe these things are not requirements, but presumably, if you're if you're releasing a data set site, it's because you want people to use it and you want it to be effective and easy for them. So, yeah, yeah. I can imagine some explicit indicators of, of what that would look like would be well received. Hmm. Okay, that's a good that's a good action. Um, okay. Um, it also, sorry, it also includes the versions of the specs. I just realised on that on that page. I'm, I'm sure this is this is the detail now. But um, above the um, doc docs, there's the version, which at a point where there's multiple versions again might become right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Get more uh, yeah. interesting. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and do we need the? Hmm. Is that in the JSON anywhere? Yes. Versioning yeah. is covered in the JSON? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, both types of versioning. Okay. And the booking spec versioning also. Interestingly, we haven't thought about yet, but probably do need to think about, I suspect, where the booking stuff lives on this page because we haven't we haven't added booking to the it's in the JSON, but it isn't. Um I did have a quick thought on this actually. I don't know what you guys think. Um uh, just on this template, because um uh yeah, the kind of person that likes to make like fun whizzy things um, that you could press, uh, you could press a, a link alongside documentation discussion uh, that was the open booking API and the uh, card could flip like it already does when you open the page around and on the other side could be the API details of how you access it, the Swagger document mm -hmm. and the stuff. Um, so as not to um, 
make the uh, page two much more complicated. Um, that was just one idea. But I, I mean, or, or yeah, some other some other way of putting like that information in. Yeah, that takes a little bit of that'll take some wireframing, I think. Yeah, uh, hmm. especially because presumably we want all this to work markup only. We don't want to have JavaScript strangeness happening. Um, yeah, that, you're right. That's very true. So CSS3 is what I was thinking that does the flip, but you're yeah, absolutely, it shouldn't be reliant on that. So it would need to be, yeah, maybe that's too much for, for this. Maybe, maybe something a bit more like scroll down. <laughs> I, th I, th I think so. Just because if you're writing something to sort of scrape it or parse it, it's going to be, yeah, uh, the markup has to be quite stable um yes although they shouldn't have to parse it in fairness because it's json ld structured data that's within but um but 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 still um yeah absolutely having uh, uh having a standardized most basic form of something sounds good mm. um so is that is that like i guess what in terms of that one are we what's the best way of moving that forward because i suppose we do need to do that in a in like in a sense before the spec is finished potentially as in yeah i mean it has to go into the spec yeah into 1.0 yeah um i think it's a github issue and a bit of a, a bit of a discussion actually yeah cool yeah, yeah. That sounds good um, and i think i think yeah your suggestion of wireframing is kind of helpful that if if we can have that conversation about something visual that might be that might be good yeah, I guess maybe a quick, quick question for, for Dom and maybe for Oli is, is if, if you were expecting to see an interactive API where you could make calls, um, would that change what you were looking for on this page? Just to feed into that. Um, well, yeah, that's the thing. You see, being a, you know, I do a lot of work with APIs, being an uh, API developer, when I went to the documentation, I would expect to go to like a swagger endpoint and then be able to make the calls and then read the documentation on every available call and what parameters it takes and so on. That's where I'd be expecting to find it. Yes. So actually we need to change the labels here because documentation would take people in maybe the wrong direction if the, the credentials or uh, yeah, or maybe we need to make sure that the booking API is called kind of um, booking credentials or something or booking, I don't know. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like, we're, okay, just to be, clear in agenda terms. So um, under outstanding issues, that was the third point. API description, are we content to offload most of that work here to Swagger Open API? Oh, I'm sorry, Tim, completely disregarding your agenda. Yeah, great. Well, well no, it's, it's <laughs> to clarify that this was sort of already, there has been some discussion about this already. Okay. Um, and it sounds like the steer from Dom is ba basically yes. And the conversation is, how do we make it clear that that is what's happening? And that actually we're talking about two different ways of interacting with resources on one data set page. Well, speaking as someone who's written the API, APIs with Swagger and without Swagger, I would definitely recommend um, using Swagger as much as possible. Uh, it makes the whole process a lot easier. We've had issues where we've had, you know, made new changes and stuff and had to wait quite a while for um, updates to go through. So actually, someone's actually updated the documentation. So it just makes everything a lot easier. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we're, we're going at this sort of from the other angle. Um, so the, the swagger is really doing just a documentation function here. Um, but at the least, it's a kind of universally recognized way of approaching API interaction and documentation. So we'd be leveraging that. Yeah, and uh, also, if it has the full um, the full support, so you can start generating classes and stuff off it, can't you? It's quite useful. Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't think I don't think we're there, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the slight the slight problem with the swap. I mean, you, yes, I suppose actually what we'd be talking about is translating the models data models into Swagger form. Yeah, which is um, fairly non-trivial. Um, however. Uh, that's just in the terms of the data model. Um, there is a bit of the booking spec that isn't the um, 
data activity um, opportunity data side and that is much more uniform so you could the booking spec itself is probably yeah, well yeah uh, almost certainly easily describable in swagger and then if we just have a pl placeholder that says opportunity data goes here uh, that would probably save us uh, so it's not possible just to decorate i'm not sure what what you've done but it's not you know you, the code i'm not sure it's, it's not possible just to decorate the classes and so on and all the methods and then so that's what i do done with my api you just decorate all the methods and the classes and then it just runs it and it just generates it all automatically for you so the, the, the challenge we have here is that the um for reasons of semantic web fun uh the uh, data model is 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 fa is fairly flexible, not as flexible as some. Um, we've actually heavily constrained it compared to the uh, schema.org, which is the kind of standard for for doing um, this kind of data sharing. Um, but even with the constraints in place, it's still fairly flexible, um, which means that uh, you can describe a number of different. Um, there's the the there's like a type hierarchy and things like that. Um, so. Uh, so, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that it's uh, it's just because there's a there's a there's a an, uh, an object model that exists um, that has its own type hierarchy, which is right. separate, to, and that's already got code generation stuff behind it as well, because that's kind of it's come from that direction. Right. Um, okay. But but we can certainly so it would be a case of probably manually creating a Swagger doc or creating it. Well. Yeah yeah probably manually creating it from the endpoints um which is something that we had absolutely intended to do um it's just to kind of to do to do this item um uh yeah but i i guess is uh, t tim is that not quite the point you're making with that agenda item there i just realized yeah, well, I, yeah i was making the more limited point that are we happy to treat documentation of the api and the api endpoints as something that lives more or less in swagger rather than something that lives on the data set page that was that was it was a mu that much more restricted view less architectural uh focus yes so um uh, so from what i am I'm, if i'm understanding uh that then uh then there is also the ability well there is there is and there isn't there's an argument uh I, I, potentially there isn't but i don't know uh the ability within scheme.org to um describe uh api endpoints in detail um, and then, and therefore, I suppose, do that on the data set side as so, well. Yeah, so, yeah, that's the, that's the contrast, yes. Do we have all of that markup, all of that JSON, basically, on the, on the data set page, or does it live in Swagger or OpenAPI? Um, so there, there was a conversation about this in the W3C, um, sorry, yeah, in the W3C data set site group, which I can link to. Um, I still remember the URL. Um, and that, that was basically saying that, um, so, so ha having done an analysis of all the various documents around the use of entry points and actions, um, it does appear that that's not the intended purpose, uh, documenting lots of different endpoints of an API. Um, okay. And the, the discussion in that forum um, with the chap who's, um, um, uh, who's also involved in that, uh, he's very much, he was very much pushing the point that um, this is about describing it, um, not, well, there's two words, isn't there? There's like a technical description and there's like a very high level fuzzy description. And I've lost all the terms from that conversation. So I'm going to go quickly look at them up and uh, come back to you. But yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like basically it's not the, the, the preferred approach is to use Swagger uh, because everyone understands Swagger and that's what that's designed for. Um, you can, using Hydra and other things, try and do that within the schema.org framework, but uh, that's not generally what uh, what the schema.org intended. And from, from what Dom said, and I, I think probably speaking to developers generally, swagger is kind of what you'd be expecting. Um, that that's, that's sort of a natural flow, I think, for most developers. Yeah. Um, okay, so that leaves only um, representing software and supported features. Um, so this is actually about how we represent the software that is supporting the booking API. Um, just to go to the uh, very long discussion. Um, so it's just a question of what that JSON looks like specifying um, both what software is responsible for supporting booking functionality and describing what kind of functionality 
that software supports, which is what the point of um, feature list is here. Um, and I think probably this is not a forum for um, hashing that out in detail because there's a long thread to go through there, but I think it's more like a call to action of please go through the, the thread and um, either sign off on it or dissent from it as, as desired. Um, because it's probably, um, hmm. it's, I, I feel like it's, this is one usable representation here. Um, and it would be possible to come up with other usable representations. Um, however, my imagination is at a sort of an end with this. <laughs> I can't think what the um, alternative representations would be. Um, unless, Nick, you've got something off the top of your head that, that this fails to match. Yeah, I know. I, I think um, the only question I had was the teacher list being a, an array, but maybe that, that makes sense because you've got, uh, well, I suppose if, if it is an array, which is true, maybe they're all true. Maybe we just need to, to formalize, is it, and, is, it, is it the union of the features across the array that is expected to be the total feature list, or are they alternative representations of the same? Uh, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I would have assumed it was the union, um, but um, okay, which is interesting in itself because you you might have if there's if it's the union and one of them might be the, the certification site and then another one might be just documentation about other add-ons that you've added to the um, to the thing, and in which case how does a machine reading a machine that's reading the certs and deciding what booking endpoints have what features in order to decide what they can connect to. Uh, how does it know which one of those is machine readable? I guess it will have to jump into both and look. Um, um, I think feature list would actually be necessarily all items in that would be machine readable. Using the same, well, I guess the yeah, and then, then maybe there's the structure question because the machine readable format that we're currently discussing and the feature list stuff is for uh, is the is the kind of test certificate um, is the test suite certificate specific format, um, which is kind of kind of custom to that on the basis that well it's yeah it's its own its own, own little tool at the minute, um, so well I, I guess if they were all machine it, but I suppose if they were machine readable or not, maybe it doesn't matter as if if the idea is that you have to go to visit each one in order to determine which one is the thing you're looking for, machine readable or not. It might be that it, you resolve a URL, there's no machine readable stuff, or it's machine readable but not a certificate, or it's machine readable and, and it is a certificate that you're looking for. And so you maybe have to just just bounce through all the options in that list until you find the thing. Um, so what's the specific use case you're thinking of here? Because as as discussed in the thread, it would and with the with the certificate, it's it's saying I definitely pass tests for this particular flow is is what information you're pulling out of that. Um, yes. Yeah, so that so the the, the thread. Uh, sorry. The um the 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 certificates. Uh, I think I think they do a few, they tend to do a few things. Um, uh, so some of the things that, that that's Jason at the moment states is um, that it, it definitely does session series and scheduled session and whatever and it also definitely has these subset of features mm -hmm. so if I'm only going to integrate with endpoints for example that um, accept paid bookings then right. I would have to um, filter on that um, and if uh, and then it also has a um, uh, things it doesn't do is not not implemented, which I suppose is the reverse of that. Mm -hmm. So I guess the use case I was thinking of was if if one was to, I, and this is probably a, a kind of a slightly later stage scaling question rather than immediate, but um, the point where we've got a hundred endpoints and you just want to find out which ones are X feature, right. um, then you know then querying that information. I mean, it wouldn't be the, the kind of spider approach to gathering the data for the data set site that already exists is only one step further to then gather the JSON within the certificate. 
as well. I'd yeah. keep going down that. So you could just extend whatever spidering algorithm you have by one step, and then you've got a database full of all the features of all the APIs that you've got access to. Um, and at that point, then you can, for example, you could then take that information, filter it to find the ones that are paid, and then talk to those guys to get connected. So you know, uh, in that in that way, um, so it just makes that spidering uh, slightly more um, onerous, I suppose. If there's if there's other options in there that are of, di of different formats. Um, well, I suppose what else could go in the feature list? Um, I mean, it could be a certification issued by another kind of test suite, um, you know, from another authority, which might have exactly the same format. Would we, we would be residing in a different URL, basically. Um, and I think, again, not a, not a problem right now, but in the in a in a happily envisioned future, you would have more than one system capable of doing that, um, and you would want to advertise the fact that you conformed to you know, or that you were usable within you know different sets of of tooling that way. So I think it's useful to keep it an array that way. Um, but is well, I suppose that the question then is: is it worth making it a structured object? Um, I don't know if that's going too far in the in the other direction, but you could have feature list when each item in the feature list is a um, a, bit, a bit like when when the endpoints are defined, um, the type or the the mime type or whatever is in there, and then the uh, the endpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. What is what is the type of feature list in schema? Do you know? Uh, it'll be links up there. Um. Uh, oh, it's it's text in URL, right? Yeah. So it doesn't at the moment have. Well, not that we could we can add it. Obviously, had had a new um, uh, type to the range. Um, hmm. Right. So sorry. So your your concern specifically is where does the human readable documentation about the semantics of the certification live? Is that well more that if you've got. So this was a debate that we had in the other in the other forum around um, the difference between human readable and machine readable documentation and whether they should be the same or different in terms of properties. Um, the conclusion there seemed to be to have them different so that you could reason about um, things you don't understand. So if you don't understand what they are, you can just say, "Oh, well, the human stuff CSI should probably present it to the browser stuff that's machine readable. If I don't understand it, I'll ignore it, um, or at least know that I shouldn't." Under, that know that I don't understand it, and I should. Um, so that was that was kind of separating from that perspective. But then within the machine readable content, there, um, there is, um, I just let me get the actual link. Um, there is a um, a way of describing the different endpoints with a content type. Oh yeah, this is it. Um, post it in. Oh, okay, this triggers a memory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is I know this is a few months ago now. Yeah, if you just open the link I've sent over, that's um, that's one of them. And in fact, if you go, if you scroll slightly further down to um, three point three point two as well, to give you another example. Yeah, so this is the idea that there's two different encoding formats, mm -hmm. and they've both got endpoints. So if you're looking for a particular format of description, if you're looking for a swagger doc, you can use the open API uh, mime type there mm -hmm. to get your swagger doc. So going, yeah, so, so you could, um, but this is this is in a different part of the data set size as well. So if you wanted to enumerate all the swagger docs from all the various endpoints, you could do that in theory by mm -hmm. just, you could very specifically find the URLs for those and retrieve them. So uh, wonder whether in this, this is a similar thing. Uh, if we're going to have a situation where there'll be multiple um, test suites, which makes sense, or, or different validation mechanisms, then maybe having something like this, where it, you know type of certification provider or test suite or something uh, mm -hmm. in encoding format, maybe we, we could just inherit from Creative Work and use encoding format, and people can make their own MIME types up. Um, okay. Um... Yeah, that seems um, that seems sensible. Um, obviously, it adds some complexity, um, but at least it's at least it's a pattern applied elsewhere, as you say. 
Um, so it's it's <laughs> it's not really increasing the complexity of this particular specification, really. If you got it if you got it right once, you can get it right twice fairly readily. Um, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe maybe it strikes the balance between extensibility, as you say, and not conf having one body that ends up being the only one we can use and machine readability. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Dom, Ollie, do you have any any thoughts, or was is this getting into the weeds for you here? Yeah, I'm not sure what to, what to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, uh, so Nick, if you could just um, could you add that onto that GitHub yeah. discussion? Um, yeah, I'll, sure. Yeah. I will thumbs up that. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, um, and I'm af I'm afraid, uh, Nick, I'm going to. Uh, make you continue talking um, oh. because um, that's the data site, data set site uh, outstanding items. Um, however, uh, er emerging earlier in discussion is um, this morning was an inordinately complicated discussion of schedules, or rather, schedules are inordinately complicated. Therefore, we have to come up with a, a solution. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh Yes. Okay. So, shall I um, do a, a kind of summary of this? Then, is that? If you could, yes, I could provide a high-level summary. But I suspect all that would then happen would be that you <laughs> filled in all the details. So, if I can leave you to that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, happy to. Uh, so this. Uh, yeah. This. This. This is. Um, yeah. This is an interesting example of like evolving standards and pros and cons of that. Well, I mean, there's only pros of evolving standards, I suppose. But when the modeling spec was put together, the opening hours specification within the modeling spec wasn't fully defined. Um, and then it was left to the implementer to figure out what types to use on, on the basis of a, a very rough schema.org definition. And so um, assumptions were made by implementers at the time, which led us to uh, a solution, which is the one that's currently in use um, in a couple of feeds. Well, I, I think Gladstone have implemented it, and then um, I, I think it's in like two other systems, maybe. Um, so that's all the Gladstone fees plus two others. Okay. Um, and uh, but no one else. Um, and so uh, and so that's so that's 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 interesting because then we've got like a there's not many people currently doing the thing. Um, and then the other the other question was um, well so. So going back a step, so what is the thing that we're talking about? The thing we're talking about is opening hours. Um, trying to get uh, to uh, this kind of view where you can look at a particular place and say, when's it open? Um, and it turns out that it's not completely as straightforward as it sounds to just uh, display that information. So and that's what the rest of this, uh, this little uh, issue talks about. So um, features from a bit of research that uh, I've done there with some of the, 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 the images further up. Um, so you've got you can see that in the images you've got uh, Monday to Thursday, so generally there's a range, usually the weekdays are the same. You've then got um, bank holidays included there as a specific feature. Um, so uh, that's something that people do use and describe. And there was a debate that happened um, a few days ago with the Everon Active team. Um, so to surface that here, uh, one of the contentions uh, from that team was maybe um, public holidays are not useful. Um, because it's too general. In the sector, we probably have Easter and Christmas and everything, and like May Bank holidays are all different times. So, and I think that was very specific potentially to um, everyone active's way of working. Um, evidence shows here that there are a number of centers that do actually use that to, um, to describe their opening times. Bank holidays is generally a thing that, that is done, which explains also why schema.org included that in their spec. Um, so, um, so yeah, so then we um, basically taking exactly what what so ski, so the the modeling spec doesn't actually give us the detail past just use opening hours specification at the moment. Um, so what this is proposing is that we actually do give the next level of detail, um, really, so that we can get a bit of convergence where there might otherwise not be. Um, and uh, I've linked here to the Google recommendations, which in the Google um, um, own structured their own structured data reading and um, they do have a, a kind of whole set of scenarios which i've effectively just lifted and shifted into the proposal because obviously they've thought this through and done all the they've had all the different uh, angles on it 
Um, so if, if Tim on the right, you click on business hours, uh, just as the third example in that top list. Uh, and table of contents on the right. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So thank you. So this is um, stunner hours, late night hours, all day hours, seasonal hours. You'll recognize these headings from the document. Um, so uh, basically just um, there, this is what they do. Uh, it's quite obvious how this works. You've got the day of week, you've got uh, enumeration there. You notice they don't actually have schema.org slash in there. And if you scroll up a little bit above that, uh, you'll see it says, we accept both schema.org notation and blah. So they've recognized that some people are using schema and some people don't. Um, obviously, we prefer schema uh, as a policy in, in the open active specs. Um, so that's why our stuff has got that in. But, but largely, apart from that minor difference, um, our stuff matches this um, as, as they've outlined. Um, and uh, it matches it in, in a way that you've got the array of days of week and that's, that's important because currently the models that we've, we've had in place and the .NET library and the other libraries don't have an array for day of week. They actually only allow a single entry there, which is unfortunate because it means the implementations as, as they have already cracked on have, have implemented that as a single uh, entry. So although we could say, let's stick with the single option, um, the problem is that that then makes it more difficult for everybody because if what you really want is to be able to say Monday to Thursday is this, and we end up forcing people to duplicate data and then on the data consumer side, try and bring it back together again to produce the same thing. Um, what I, th I think really has happened here is it's just a slight oversight in terms of that tooling, which I'm probably partly responsible for about two years ago. Um, so uh, it was one of those kind of moments of like, oh gosh, yeah, we just assumed it and cracked on and didn't think to read uh, other implementations. But to be fair to us at the time, there was a big surface area to get on with and implement. So. I think not foreseeing the uh, importance of different opening hours specification over holidays and COVID lockdowns. 2018, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different world. <laughs> true. true. Um, so uh, yes. Um, so um, so yes. Uh, um, so Tim, if you would mind flicking back to the um, the other uh, page, then um, uh, wherever it is. Then great. So you can see here that we've got day of week as an array. Um, we've got closes uh, and opens, which is exactly the same. Um, and then we've got um, some optional properties uh, further down, which is the um, valid, valid from and valid through. So actually they have um, in their example, they also have um, options where you've got seasonal opening hours so they can op be open for Christmas or you know, the ice rink is open for Christmas. Home. You can use these to indicate that that's the case. Um, you can also, uh, if you keep going further down in, in schema.org, you've also got this thing called special opening hours. Special opening hours means that you can uh, specify overrides for the case of example lockdown. Um, and what that ends up with is this example uh, as, uh, as Tim is scrolling through. So you've got um, the special opening hours there at the bottom, um, which are kind of saying between that day and that date, um, the, everything's closed. Um, the other thing that Google defines is that opens and closes have special meaning for 0000. If they're both the same, it's closed. Also, 20, 0000 and 2359 means always open. Um, and so, uh, again, just lifting that out. So I haven't done any creative thinking here. I've literally just elegantly copied what Google's already done and, and put it in here. So um, just that then. Uh, means that we, we've got special opening hours so you can then have a lockdown scenario so you could put in all the hours that you're usually are open and then you can say actually but between these two dates we're going to not be open because of lockdown and add that in uh, or but that same information that same special opening hours could be used for lockdown it could be used for christmas opening hours that are specific to christmas day it could be used for uh, any type of very day specific um, hours um, so uh, yeah and so this is and then um to help unblock the implementations i mentioned that are kind of looking to crack on with this at the moment um i've then gone ahead and um, made the update to the, the tooling to reflect that array change um so even though that is a breaking change to the um to the validator and that things will previously did validate will no longer in that respect um there's only those those systems i mentioned involved and so talking to each of them individually if we can get them all to bump and add an array I've already emailed um, two of them this morning just to change it to an array. And if we can catch this, I suppose, before it gets too broad, widely implemented, uh, and then we don't have this weird, because there's nowhere else in the specs 
apart from one specific exception, which was made for, for um, reasons um, where you have an array or a single option. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you have this kind of duality, then every, all the whole model gets, like the complexity grows in all parts. So uh, that's, is that a good summary tip? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess my only reservation is this does seem quite complicated to parse. Um, and, and having an array or single would, would make that much more so, um, or irritatingly more so anyway. Um, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, as you say, it's already part, you know, a well-established part of schema.org. Um, and adopting it, given the, the need, seems pretty sensible. Um, but I, I'd, um, I'd ask Dom and Ollie if they had any uh, opinions on this. Do you have any ideas, Ollie? Or? Sorry? Uh, no, nothing for me, Dom. Go ahead. Um, I think we originally used iCal in uh, open referral. Well, that was quite limiting in one way, so this might be a good way of going ahead of it. That's interesting. You used iCal for opening times? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because we give it as an option. That's interesting. So we do use iCal in uh, a different place, which is for schedules for recurring events. Um, yeah. But that's that's interesting. But well, I, I would suspect that you'd have challenges with that, right? Because that's actually sorry, no, it might be new schedules. Sorry, you're what I said. <laughs> I think that's how we used it as well. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, we can do some research, I guess, into <laughs> into that. Um, yeah, certainly. Certainly, iCal has been useful at points for us. Hello. Oh. Sorry, did you lose me or I, I lost you or what happened there? I just went quiet for a few moments. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we lost Dom for a little bit. Um, no, I'm, I'm still here. Okay, great, great. Okay. Um, so, so you were saying you were saying that in fact uh, your recollection is that open referral actually uses something close to the schema.org approach? Uh, no, it doesn't. It uses the same thing. Um, so you, you, you specify uh, opening times and closing times and so on. Okay. Um, we'll be addressing you, the area, but... Yeah, you have an array of them. Um, I don't, I think there are like notes and so on for special, special circumstances, but nothing like what we have now. I imagine uh, you'd have to Write your current opening times and update it all or, so, or something, and you know, have a new list. I mentioned that's you how you have to do it with the current spec. Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll take I'll take a look at that. You're, and you're speaking about open referral, the the US original, rather than open referral UK. Um, yeah, I mean, the UK one is the same as the US. So it's got a bit chopped out for the most part, with one or two extra tables. Okay, I will take a look at that then, just for my own information. Um, I think, Nick, given the given the sort of internal consistency of this, um, I'd be happy to approve this for um, integration into the into the specification two point one, I guess. Um, and we've only got a couple of minutes, but did anybody else have any other business they wanted to raise before the end of the call? No. Okay, thank you all very much for joining. Um, I feel like for those of you who are first time attenders, this was a fairly uh, deep dive introduction. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, great. Um, I'll be circulating the agenda for the next call a bit more in advance. We'll be looking at how we represent um, courses or you know, series of, of events in the next call. Um, um, so sorry, Tim, on, on the courses one, have, you, uh, have we invited uh, Lee and others to that? Um, thinking MCI active people. No, yeah, no, though obviously we do have to have the right people in, in that call. No, I was just, just yeah. checking if they were aware of that. That sounds because th there was a conversation literally two hours ago where they were talking about courses uh, in that forum. I think it was GLL, MCR, and someone else. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very much alive. So I think we, <laughs> it's definitely, definitely next on the agenda. Um, but yeah, we, we do need to make sure anyone immediately affected is there. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Okay, at the top of the hour or at the 
bottom of the hour. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining and uh, hopefully see you all in a couple of weeks. Thanks very much.